the Shabbat in here. Father, we acknowledge you tonight that even if Fox has it twisted and CNN has it twisted, there is but only one God. We celebrate the God of heaven tonight. We thank you that his eye is turned in our direction. And we call upon the God that answers by fire tonight. Let the God of Elijah be made manifest in the midst of us to bring us into our next decision and our next movement and our next place for you. In the name of the Son of God, we lift our voice with great anticipation concerning the victory that you desire to release in this place. In the name of Jesus. Come on, throw your head back. You've got the best shot you got. Woo! Come on, Zion. I can't hear you. I said give him the best praise you got. Hallelujah. Come on, let the high praises of God be in their mouths. A two-edged sword in their hand. We give you glory. Hallelujah. You can be seated all in the, in the room in the presence of the Lord. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, good evening, Living Waters. It's such an honor to be here. Um, I am grateful to be here. I sense that there is something very significant about um, this meeting and this gathering. And uh, there is a powerful anointing on the next couple of days that I'm going to do my best to interpret but I'm humbled to be here uh, and to be a partaker of the history of what I believe to be a tremendous church and uh, a couple that I love so very dearly and um, when I met your pastor the Lord spoke to me um, and told me I was to do everything in my power to see to it that he succeeded and I don't know exactly what that means um, but my my covenant to this family is that whatever I have in my custodial uh, stewardship is going to be theirs to push them to what God has called them to do. Let's honor this awesome couple. Can we do that? Come on, let's do better than that. Let's do that. <laughs> um, so I mean that I love them and I love them hard. I love them hard. Um, I used a tremendous amount of discipline while sitting there. I told my executive pastor, I feel the sound of the house here. It, it felt like home. And that's not good for me because at home I'm wild. I'm a wild child. So I was hoping, I was hoping Mother Christabel would just be quiet a little longer and, and loose me. Uh, but I'm excited to be here. I, um, I want to acknowledge all of you that are fine for gifts in the room. God bless you. It's so exciting to preach to preachers, and uh, I always love uh, the opportunity to share God's word and his mind with the people of God. It is apparent uh, is making demand on the power of the prophetic word tonight, and so uh, I'm going to uh, give you what heaven has given me, and then we'll see what happens afterward. Is it okay? Um, this is a preaching house, and uh, you can always feel preaching houses, and so that works for me because I'm a preacher, and uh, I teach along the way. But for the most part, I'm a preacher, and I do have something I want to share with you that I think is appropriate for all of you individually, and you can uh, custom make it to where you are and what this season has meant to you, uh, but I believe it's a corporate word that has extreme personal significance. Uh, so I'll give you two passages of scripture, and I'll preach through it intelligently until I can no longer do that. And then we'll see what's going on. We're starting in the book of John, the first chapter. And uh, I'm going to give you uh, quite a bit of reading out of John chapter 1. And if you have been in church longer than 30 minutes, you know this. And uh, then I'll give you another perspective of the very same said author uh, in 1 John chapter 3. But we're starting with the gospel of John, the first chapter. I'm going to give you 12 verses. When you are there, say, I'm there. If you're not there, say, wait on me. I'll wait on you. <clears throat> John chapter 1, verse 1, reads this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, referring to the word, and without him was not anything 
made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. There was a man sent from God whose name was John, and the same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. Verse 9 says, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Verse 10, he was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. Verse 11 says, he came unto his own, and his own received him not. Check this out. But as many as received him, to them gave he, scream this next word like you feel with the Holy Ghost, power to become the sons of God even to them that believe upon his name. Goes uh, Uber all the way to 1 John chapter 3. So that we can support this thought in the first epistle of John, the third chapter. And I'll give you just three out of here. It says, Behold what manner of love the Father hath bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons of God. Therefore the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it doth not yet appear what we shall be. But we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. Verse 3, And every man that hath this hope in him purify himself even as he is pure. Father, you're a better preacher than I am. Preach this in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, tonight I want to talk to you about the power to become. Uh, the power to become. There is something that hell is deathly afraid of with regard to you as a person. And it is not necessarily where you've been. It is not necessarily where you are. But the most powerful threat against the forces of darkness in your life right now is who you are about to become. And uh, prophetically speaking, those of you that are under the sound of this word have probably been in a season where heaven has been investing in the thing he's called you to become. And the challenge with that is that often when the thing that God wants us to become arrives in our life, it offends what we knew to be true. It disrupts paths and journeys. It has the potential to unsettle things that uh, formerly brought us peace and security. Uh, but when you are on a journey to become something, there are certain inevitable phenomena that has to happen around the thing that is about to become something that it is not. So the fundamental thought is that you are something that you are not going to be. Just follow me. And the thing that you are going to be is directly related to why you were born. The person, the thing you are now is a transitional phase that demands an end if you are going to adequately handle what was on the mind of God when he created you. Tell somebody, I'm about to become, I'm about to become. Um, this is a spiritual principle that we're going to use Jesus' life to reveal and highlight, but everything and all the activities surrounding Jesus' becoming is also very, very significant for all of you. And the most profound point about this is that God's plan is not attached to the person you are today. And that is something that may be a bit startling considering that we live in a culture that is so committed to remaining the same and to having different versions and variations of, of who we are and where we are. But over and over again in the scriptures, it is proven that God is invested in your change. More appropriately, your evolution, how you mature into a space and mature to be able to handle certain powers and abilities and perspectives that your former self would perhaps abandon, abort, sabotage, or destroy. And so who and what God has planned for you is directly connected to the you he's making you. 
But don't make the mistake of assuming that when God goes into making you what you're going to become, that it's going to be easy, it's going to be pleasing, it's going to be uh, uh, acceptable. You will have a loss of several things because in the power to become is a budget, it's a cost, it's a price. Certain bullet-pointed things that you must undergo if you are to surrender your, your present self in exchange for your future self, but it's necessary that you go through changes. And uh, so this is important. I'm going to start you off with a couple of basic principles, and then we'll find our preach and put pressure there. The first principle that we're going to give you out of both of these scriptures is that what you're willing to become will determine what you're going to walk into. Write that down. What you're willing to become is going to determine what you're going to walk into. It's very important that you realize that. There are certain things that God promised Abraham that Abram might ruin. There are certain things that Peter was destined to do that Simon could not conceptualize. So there are things that God has attached to your evolution that in your immaturity and the prison of your present, you may not see. So that's the first principle. What you're willing to walk into is determined by what you're willing to become. Number two, what you're willing to become will determine what you have access to. These are just basic principles. What you're willing to become will determine what you have access to. Ask me why. Because there are resources allotted to your future that the person or the church or the company or the family you are right now can't fathom or steward very well. How can the allotment or the wealth or the prosperity or the revelation that's assigned to your future self be adequately handled by the person you are today? You are limited in the perspective. You are limited in the wherewithal. You are limited in the emotional and intestinal fortitude to handle the things that God has given you for the success of your future. So what you are willing to become will determine what you've got access to. I'll get back there. The third one is this. What you're willing to become will always come front what you thought you were supposed to be. You are never going to move forward in purpose, in destiny with the exact same ideas of how your outcome would have been. Now, many of you around this time, uh, Thanksgiving, Christmas, all of that, you become very reflective and sometimes there is a subsequent grief that's attached to your reflection because everybody has that moment where they look in the mirror or they look at their bank account or they look at their family or or they look at their rental lease or whatever the stuff or the details around and you say I never thought I would be here by now ah, but because uh, uh, prior to coming in the revelation of who God wanted you to be you established certain ideas that bring you security by 30 I'll do this by 50 I'll do this I'll have this much money here I have been and moved there but how many of you understand here comes a mini preach that God has a way of putting his finger in the thing you plan for your life. You don't know God until you've known him to disrupt where you were going. He has a tendency of disrupting journeys and interrupting plans and messing with ideas and messing with appointments and it's the way he remains God. Slow down. It's the way he stays in control. If he doesn't mess up plans and if he doesn't disrupt ideas, then there's a way that you may attribute and espouse your future to your own strength and your own intelligence and your own wherewithal but the way he remains God is that he hides certain details from you and limits your ability to peer into what he purposed for you and you will plan a city and he'll move you from there you will plan a spouse and he'll switch it and move you from there you will plan a friendship and he'll put his finger upon it and make sure that although that's what you saw that it's not what's going to carry you into the future he'll take you through changes sit down so what what he what you're willing to become must offend confront punch in the face what you thought you would be glory to the God of the Bible because contrary to popular opinion 
God is not committed to your personal desires. He has no attachment to your fantasy for your life. He's not at all moved or swayed by your personal desires for the type of life you want. He has his plan. You want to know something? And he will protect his plan. Watch me, even if it hurts your feelings. He will protect his plans even if it upsets you and even if it puts you in strange places and in strange predicaments because his plan is attached to your purpose and it's connected to his prosperity and his provisions for your future. So without that necessary confrontation, you may develop a tendency to want to remain how you are. You may develop the, the tendency to make a decision and expect God to bless it. Make a move and want him to finance it. Build the thing that he didn't call you to build and want him to rescue you in the meantime. But when God starts talking to you about what he made you to become, he has to find a thing that you found safety in and wreck it. He has to find a thing that you would hide behind for security and for acceptance. And he has to put his finger on it. That was free. The rest will cost you. What you're willing to become, I'm not preaching that. What you're willing to become will often offend the place of your origin. God has a way of making you something that's different from the thing, person, space, place, environment necessary for your, for your beginnings. Your beginnings are foundations, fundaments, frameworks for the future. But just because something began you does not mean that that same, that same something is going to escort you to where you're going. I'm going to prove it with the Bible. So, 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 so God has a way of challenging you to become a thing that would exist before you may or may not be responsible for. That's something you need to know. Uh, finally, what you're willing to become will radically affect how you are seen. How you are seen, what you look like, what people know you for, your reputation, your reputability, the things that are going out in the wind about you. Does that make sense to you? Okay. So help me preach and tell the person next to you, you are about to witness my becoming. Just say that. Come on, open your mouth. Don't be angry. and tell them, you are about to witness my becoming. I'm going to become in your face. You will watch me become something that I was not before. This city is about to watch this church become something that it did not used to be. I am here this weekend not to prophesy houses and cars. I am here to articulate what you are about to become. I am here to interpret what you are about to be formed into. Now I can preach. The, the word become, Strong gives it to us this way. It's this Greek word, genomai, and it means to emerge or to transition from one realm or condition to another. It literally means the change of condition, uh, state, or place, but it also has the idea of, of becoming manifest because of motion. Everybody knows that that word motion talks about movement and shifts and changes, and uh, there are certain speeds and certain motions that have the power to change you. It has the power to molecularly reconstruct you from one particular agent or one particular thing to another thing, okay? Uh, it, it's the reason why why uh, that this year, anybody know that this year went by real quick? It, it's, it's almost like when you are a scientist and you want to change the molecular structure of something, you put it in a test tube and you spin it and you spin it and you spin it until it changes how it was before. Did anybody feel like this year just got able to get, I mean it's like God, we were just celebrating the 4th of July, now we're going into 2016. What is the acceleration about? It's not just about getting you somewhere quickly. It's about changing you. And if I move you too slow or allow you to manage your own time, I can make you what I'm calling you to be. So now I'm going to exegete both of our texts and then they're going to prophesy and then you're going to go home. <laughs> this uh, John, this uh, text in the Gospel of John shows the becoming of Jesus. Jesus had a becoming. He did not come to the world as a fully grown adult. He didn't come out of Mary's womb as a 33-year-old king of the world. 
he had a becoming place. And prior to him getting through the womb of Jesus, we see what his becoming was like. And John 1 gives us information about that. It says, in the beginning was the? Now, so he began in God in eternity as the Word. He began as the word. It gives him personality, gives him context, gives him meaning. But then, if you pay close attention to the journey of verses 1 through 5, it says, and then the word became life. He became life. So he uh, uh, has this evolutionary thing where he starts as the word, and then he becomes life. And then from life, the Bible says he becomes light. So already, prior to becoming the seed of Joseph, this man has gone through changes. In heaven, before eternity, he goes through like a three-level graduation from the word, then to light, then to light. And now things get real juicy because it was not until he became light that he was ready to be sent upon the planet. And in Jesus' uh, uh, process of becoming, verse 1 through 5 teaches us that he became light, but he needed a context or a backdrop for that thing that he was to be appreciated. You understand that the way light becomes appreciated or valued is in the context of darkness. So darkness was the context by which that light would be seen. It needed an environment uh, that could hold his content optimally. Does that make sense? Now here is the bad news, okay? I love preaching about bad news. This is really good. The bad news is this. The first thing you're going to have to do as a church, as an individual, as a husband, as a visionary, when God starts dealing with you about what you're about to become, is you're going to have to be willing to embrace not being comprehended. He was that light. And that light was shined in darkness. But darkness did not comprehend it. One of the signs that you are on your way to becoming the thing God called you to become is that you start going to war about why you're so misunderstood. This preach is going to be for ro uh, rows four and five. Do you know how many times people get distracted about not being understood? How many tears people cry and months people lose because we're so eager to have people comprehend us? But have you ever considered that perhaps God don't want you comprehended by every crowd and by every audience and by every relationship and it could be a distraction, for, a distraction from hell to make you waste your energy and waste your time and waste your tears trying to be understood. Many of you won't obey the call of God because of what people don't understand. Many of you won't lay your lives down because of what people will not understand. Listen to me. But it is not until you are willing to go without the understanding standing of people that you are postured to become the thing God called you to become. What's in the way of your evolution, slow down, is the fact that people's understanding has become an idol to you. It's become a distraction to you. And in this life and in your destiny, you will be given an option to follow God or to follow the applause, to follow God or to have acceptance, to follow God or to have approval. This generation has an idol called the approval of men. We despise having to be distinct and having to be took another way and having to grow up differently. But I believe there's about one to 20 people in here that's not afraid to be misunderstood. Hallelujah! If being misunderstood is going to get me miracles, I will be misunderstood. I don't need your comprehension to be anointed. I don't need your comprehension to be chosen. I I don't need you, I wish I had help here, to understand me, for me to become what God called me to be. There are things in life that are necessary, and there are other things in life that are desirable. My Bible tells me that the first test, the life Jesus had to go through, was not being comprehended. Having to show up to a place and them look and saying, what in the world is this? What's going on with you?
Those are question marks that God put there. I'm talking about 10 people whose family is looking at him like, like, what are you doing? Why are you over there? What are you doing? Why are you talking to him? Why are you moving them? But I believe tonight, one of the things that I've got to deliver you from uh, is the pressure to perform uh, for people. You missed him all there. I believe God's going to break the yoke of man pleasing off of you uh, because your addiction to approval, your addiction to applause uh, is stopping you from this. Every person that's going to become what God wants him to become. Every church that's going to become what God wants it to become must go through a season of being misunderstood. When a new thing arrives and when a new thing is being born, the old perhaps may find trouble if it had complete perspective about what the new thing has brought. Uh, so when you're misunderstood, it's a sign that there are new things working in you and new things resting on you and new things opening up in you. Is there anybody in here that feels better already that God has called you to be a lot of things. I'm trying to stop from running down there. God has called you to be victorious. He's called you to be anointed. He's called you to be wealthy. He's called you to be a warrior. But he has not called you to be liked. He has not called you to be understood. He has not called you to be accepted everywhere. Anybody that's going to do anything for God that history is reliant on must be misunderstood. We didn't understand Dr. King. We didn't understand Malcolm X. We didn't understand any major icon in their area. They become appreciated once they've done what they had to do. But imagine if they allowed the opinions of people, the criticisms of the media, the rejection of the tabloids to control their decision making. You gotta let it go. started blowing in the direction of what he made me. First thing you had to walk through was a season of this being misunderstood. Ooh, that's real good. He did it. He did it. He did it. He did it. It, it was God. It wasn't auntie, uncle, stepfather, bishop, chief apostle. It was none of them. Sometimes we have the, 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 the very uh, immature uh, habit of blaming all confusion on the devil. Now, just because God is not the author of confusion, it does not mean that he don't use it sometimes. My Bible tells me uh, that when Josiah, when they had got ready to go to battle uh, against the Amalekites, uh, that God sent confusion. And sometimes uh, it takes the dust to come up a little bit to see what people are really made of. Sometimes it takes for chaos uh, and confusion uh, for your distinction to be made manifest. So perhaps, peradventure, the reason you're dealing with what you're dealing with is because God's trying to pry out of your hand the desire to be understood. Glory to God, because if you're understood, you can be appreciated. If you can be appreciated, you can be given a place. And if you can be given a place, you can be rewarded. And if you can be re rewarded, you can go to the next level. But I'm here to tell you tonight, one of the first things I'm coming to cut off of you is a desire for people to say, I knew you were going there. There's going to be people who God hides you from. I'm about you. There's going to be people that God closes their ears, closes their eyes, and they won't be able to see what God is doing with you. They won't be able to trace and track how God is forming you. But that blindness is necessary for you to obey the God of your future. I'm talking about what you're going to become. That's just number one. Jesus, the, 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 the promised Messiah of Israel, the backdrop of his beginning was being misunderstood. What are you? Am I t Listen to me. I represent a movement of the months. Do you hear me what I'm talking about? I have a background. I got Baptists in me. I got Methodists in me. I got filled with the Holy Ghost on accident. I didn't know that people like y'all existed. When I started talking in tongue, I didn't know what to do with myself. My grandmother was a Methodist. She said, boy, shut up. My mama was a Baptist. She was like, we don't do that over here. So I ended up being a mixture, glory to God, of a lot of different streams 
things that nobody could take the credit for. And I believe the way, the reason God did it that way was so that nobody could look back and say, if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be doing that. So I had to undergo a season of being misunderstood. I had to undergo God calling me to do some stuff. And I told him, yeah, I'll do it if you tell them. And I heard the Lord say, I ain't telling them nothing because I want you to learn now how to hear me. I'm going to call you to do some things in your future that they'll never agree with and they'll never understand and they'll never partner with you. But if you go, sit down, y'all making me preach. You must be misunderstood. I feel this. You have to be misunderstood. God has to scramble people's ability to perceive you up. trying to creep to point number two but I want you to consider how much energy you put in trying to be alike <laughs> they're laughing at you because you're different you should be laughing at them because they're all the same God is trying to set you apart in this city. Who am I talking to in here? He's trying to sanctify you, and I'm not talking about an all white. I'm talking about removing you from the regular and from the normal and from the common and from the average. You are on your way to becoming. You've got to be willing to do some things that people will not understand. Point number two. Because that's rough, and God knows that that's tough on your psyche, and it's, it's something that messes with you psychologically, and it messes with you emotionally, that oil can't take it away, and glory cloths won't make it go. You know, I, okay, Lord, fine, I'll do it. They'll mock me and bully me. Okay, I get the point, right? But, you know, uh, about a month later, a year later, it does start to weigh on you, right? Right? So God is good. Come on, somebody say God is good. God is good. Come on. Come on. God is good. He's real good. Uh, he knew whoo, that Jesus would need a little help along his way. He was not what he was going to be, but he was on his way. And in order for Jesus to handle his becoming the right way, uh, the Bible says in verses 6 through 8 of this chapter of John that God sent Jesus a little help. Now, let me tell you something. Jesus was the Son of God in flesh. Come on. I, we apostolic in here, right? We know there is but one name under heaven. Come on. That's what we do. We're by men. So he was God, right? Uh, but what happens when God wants to give Jesus a template for us to learn from? Uh, and so if Jesus didn't have help, you and I would be clueless on what to do when we started to become it. Uh, so I believe Jesus went through some things uh, not because he needed him, but because we needed him. And the real truth is, uh, Jesus could have not become what he was going to become uh, without somebody to open a way before him. Here come Mr. Preach. I thought he was in Chicago. He's right here at that level. The Bible says that this guy, he was the light, and the light didn't comprehend him, and because the light didn't comprehend him. You see, when there are those who have been ordained to misunderstand you, it will make you attach quicker to the one that's been anointed to understand you. The Bible says, and this man, John, he was not that light, but he was sent to bear witness to that light, and his job was to prepare prepare the way of the Lord. Can I preach here? Who you are becoming needs a way to be made because there are certain levels and decisions and routes and paths and journeys and avenues and boulevards that God's going to take you that needs somebody to open that way for you. Let me prophesy now. God's about to send people to open the way for what you're about to become. They're going to say a thing to you. Hallelujah! Preach a thing to you. Decree a thing to you. That's going to let you be what God called you to be. Sit down, sit down. I need to walk through this. Hold on. This, this, this shows us that because you're already unlike what is, that it is necessary to be given permission, confidence to be what you're going to be. John the Baptist was that for Jesus. And you know what amazes me? is that they were related. Blood cousins had no clue that their destinies were configured in the way that it was. But this day, glory to God, when he would see cousin Jesus, he would see him in a different light. 
Now, this is the same guy that they saw at Big Mama's funeral and the, and the family reunion a couple of days ago and Nisi's graduation and all of that stuff. But he, he didn't see him. Glory to God. How he saw him this day. Uh, this day, he saw not who he was. He didn't see his graduation or his prom pics. He saw who he was becoming. John cries out from that river. Behold! Come on now. The Lamb of God who taketh away the sin of the world. He saw what he was becoming. Now, let me give you a little lesson about John. This is going to be free. John the Baptist shows up after 300 years of famine. And uh, there was a massive invasion of what the Bible calls an army of locusts. And primarily in an agricultural society, locusts were a very uh, major threat to the prosperity of the civilization in that day because they didn't have machines and factories and, and other mass employment systems. The way they made a living was by what they could grow. So imagine being uh, made wealthy and prospering and advancing on crops, and those crops come under attack. Uh, this was the silent period of God. After the Old Testament Malachi, he says nothing. We don't know what in the world happened in between Malachi and Matthew. But check this out. The first voice that shows up is this man that's been anointed for Jesus. And the Bible says that he shows up. Glory to God. Not in a St. John hat. He didn't have on Armani. His attire was a little different. I feel good. And the Bible says he had on. He was uh, wearing camel's hair. And not only did he have on camel's hair, camel's hair, I want you to pay attention to the diet of this man. He shows up not eating a Big Mac. He didn't have Chipotle. He was eating locusts and wild honey. What's the lesson? Lean in. Lean in. Lean in. Lean in. Lean in. I got to tell you a secret. God is about to send somebody to you that's going to munch on what's been munching on you. His whole anointing was to show up there dealing with the antagonist of Israel. Your problem is you want encouragement. You want a pat on the back. But I believe God's about to send your munchers. He's going to send folk that's going to devour the thing that's been after your person and after your identity and after your fears and after your desire. Shout hallelujah! God, when Jesus was on his way to becoming, he sent a man to prepare his way. Somebody that would, uh, I want to use the word administrate and properly facilitate uh, the way that was needful for him to become. I'm talking about you. God is anointing something. He's anointing a people, a place, a word, an environment that's going to sit on the side and prepare for you to arrive and to become the thing God called you to become. Now look at verse 10. This gets even more juicy. Verse 10 says, now he was in the world. He was there in that arena around it and the world didn't know him listen to me what you're willing to become will determine who knows you God has not ordained everybody to know your name now you may want to be known in certain worlds in certain arenas but God making you what he's called you to become may make you forfeit your right to be known in certain worlds. Uh, God, now here's the thing that blesses me. If you don't say amen, I'll shout myself. I envy, praise the God of the Bible. People that have the right and the privilege and the leisure, amenity is a more appropriate word, of going through changes in private. You know, I'm a shopper. I like shopping. I believe it brings God glory when I shop, you know. I believe it's one of the ways I give him my living sacrifice. Hallelujah. I love any shoppers in here. You shop till you drop and say it is good, right? Have you ever danced in a dressing room because something had the right fit on you? You just got your feet light because the jeans had the right thing. And when you are a real shopper and you want to make sure, glory to God, especially if you're spending some real money and you want to make sure that this thing is worth your investment, you go and you find you a dressing room somewhere where nobody's looking at you and a real shopper will say when we're trying something on we do crazy stuff in the mirror we stand certain ways we look certain ways we smile with your smile with your eyes you want to make sure that the clothes make sure they accompany how you look so that is a blessing somebody say a blessing that's a blessing that's a bl but what happens hallelujah when God looks at you and robs you the right to change in private what happens when God selects you and doesn't give you the privilege of 
going when nobody's looking and make you change behind closed doors. What I've learned about God is that the bigger the thing is on your life, the more likely it is you're going to change in public. He's going to put you in the middle of the stage and make you disrobe and make you reclose and make you grow up and make you fall down. And he does this so that folk around you would know that it was not by might. Come on, go with me. Nor was it by power, but it was by my spirit, saith the Lord. You, you have been going through changes. And what's made those changes so uncomfortable, glory to God, is that you couldn't do it when people were not looking. If your divorce was private, it would have been easier to undergo. If your molestation was private, you wouldn't have had a hard time coping with it. But the fact that you had to go through and have eyes on you and have people know who you were and have people understand where you were going, but you've got to realize it's all a part of your becoming. Because if you can handle going and through changes in public, then you can handle greatness in public. If you can handle going through changes before people's eyes, then you can handle being promoted before people's eyes. We want to be promoted in people's eyes, but we don't want to be bashed in front of people. We don't want to be gossiped about. We don't like when their status is about us and balls about us. But is there anybody in here that's going to make a decision tonight that if you do it in public, you got to bless me in public. you got to raise me in public. That father that seeth in secret, come on, go now, will reward you openly. Look at verse 11. Look at verse 11. There are certain worlds that God's going to make you go through changes in front of. The world of your family, the world of your background, the world of your job. You won't be able to go on a fast and say, Lord, do this in private. Ask me why. Because he wants to see if you have table manners. <laughs> you, you must earn the right to reign over kings. And the way you do that is that you make sure you handle snakes appropriately, publicly. Nobody gets promoted before they go to snake school. And you don't go to snake school in closets. You go to snake school on stages. Verse 11 says this in John chapter 1. He was sent to his own. We're talking about what's needful in order for you to become. And his own received him not. Do you know one of the things you're going to have to go through? Sit down, y'all. Y'all making me preach. <laughs> I want to be a word of faith teacher tonight. You are scheduled, because of what you're about to become, you are scheduled for a necessary rejection. I'm going to go over here because they didn't like that. You better get over here. <laughs> I feel the anointing coming in here. You have to realize that God can't risk allowing you to be accepted by everything. I'm talking Spanish to you. You don't know. You got to understand that it's a gamble for God to let you be accepted by the wrong crowd. I was talking to one of my sons in the Lord the other day, and he was going through. You know, he his father is, you know, a, a, an okay guy, but really destructive in his behaviors. And you know, he got a lot of women everywhere, some, some addiction problems. And he was just, you know, he was just going through, you know, grieving. And he, uh, we went to coffee. He said, you know, I just woke up just depressed. I didn't want to get out of the bed, having a bad time, because I just was wondering why wasn't my father there the way he wanted to be? You know, everybody else had it. Now, this guy has, has went to Ivy League school, is probably making more money than most people in his age bracket, doing really good. So I just sat there, and I kept eating. He said, Dad, I was eating. He said, Dad, I was eating. He said, why aren't you listening to me? I said, because you don't realize that God has unorthodox means of tear carrying you where he got to go. I said, let me explain something to you. Do you know what you would have been had God allowed that man with his indecision to cultivate you? You would have been a monster. Sometimes it's better for people to be absent. You missed your breakthrough than to be as present as you are because you may have come 
compromise, saying, I want to be like my daddy. And you may have been a homemonger with him. You may have been a liar with him. He may have educated you in how to be a better pimp than what you already were. So, yeah, we wish he was there, but you better not grieve that he was not there because with every temptation, come on, go with me, God will make a way of escape. Hallelujah! I'm going to preach now. Glory! You don't know what you would have been made into had the people you wanted to accept you actually did. They would have groomed you to become something you were never ordained to become. I want that to sink in a bit. I'm not going to say, I just want that to sink in. Entra do hovesa. Entro nunga baja ton porque es ella. Hacera dos mi perdoga. A necessary rejection. A need for rejection. It was the same thing Joseph went through. It was necessary that he be rejected. That rejection protected him. It guarded him. It, bar it garrisoned him. So when you're on your way to becoming, you will undergo a necessary rejection. Woo! Some of you are right there right now where you're not understanding why you can't get the cohesive chemistry between you and people that you want, but sometimes God ordains for that to be the case. Let's go to verse 12. I'm almost done. Verse 12. I'll preach harder tomorrow. Verse 12. Under the Bible says he went to his own and his own did not receive him. The Bible says in verse 12, something very interesting. But to as many as received him, to them he gave, scream that word. Come on, now he got the Holy Ghost. I don't know about the rest of y'all. Scream that word one more time. You know us Pentecostals, y'all can't say that too much without something happening to us. The Bible says to as many as received him. Now, Jesus had to give them the power to become it because it could not be, it could not be decided mentally. It could not come as a byproduct of personal decisions or goals or New Year's revolution. A power had to come upon you to become the thing you were not already. It was a, the byproduct of an impartation of the breath of God, the nostril of heaven, blasting your current status and changing your condition from where you are to where you're going. To as many as received him. Now let me teach you something. There's a lot of you in the room who are believers. But believer, being, being a believer only necessitates the partnership of your mind unto a principle. There's a lot of you that are learners. There's a lot of you that are, I don't know, you know, you're, 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 you're a lot of things. You listen, you believe. But I don't know that we have a lot of people who understand what it is to be taught to receive. Pay attention. Because when you are a believer, it has the, it, it, what it means is that you've gotten something in your mind, you've understood it, and maybe you hold your yourself accountable to it but that's not the same as receiving when you receive something it's not the byproduct of something you did with your brain it's the byproduct of something you did with your belly being a receiver has to do with how you posture yourself there's a lot of you in the room right now that believes what I'm saying but there's not a lot of you that's going to receive what I'm saying let me preach to you prophetically this is the hour of the receivers you have got to be postured the right way. Look at all that pride. Everybody is complaining about why nobody's pouring into them. You know why? The poor is never up. It's always down. And if you don't understand how to lower yourself and humble yourself, I can't pour into you. You've got to get low. Hold on, Mr. Orkin. I said get low. Get low, 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 low. How low can you go? And if you will humble yourself under the hand of the resources that God is sending you. You'll be full of what you're supposed to become. Hey, look at somebody tell them, get low. Come on, open your eyes. Say, get low. 
Now, the person behind you has got rejected because you've been talking to your neighbor. Look behind you and point your finger and say, you better get low. Because get low will determine what's next for you. Get low will determine what opens to you. Get low will determine what comes to your life. Your problem is you're not low enough. You're cute, you're fancy, you got potential, but you're high. You're lofty. You're lifted up in your own eyes. God is saying, get low. got to teach you to become a receiver because what you're going to become is going to be determined by the depth of your reception. It is those that received him that received power to become. Many of you have a desire to become, but the desire is void of the power that's needful to do it. And the reason is, is because you don't understand the posture of reception. Let's make this a little more interesting, and then I'll let you go home. First John 3 partners with this same stuff. It's, it's like a, a continual conversation. I already told you hell is mad about what you're about to become. You know, he's not scared about you right now. Right now, you're not threatening him. But the dude you're about to become, glory to God. Is there anybody in here that's excited about what they're about to become? Anybody in here that's grateful about what this church is going to become? First John 3 substantiates this as well. Praise God. And it says this. What manner of love? Has the Father shown unto us that we should be called the sons of God? Now, when God starts taking you into the changes of your becoming, it needs to be consistently reminded that it is an act of love. When God decides to call you something that is contrary to your current definition and your current experience and where you have been, uh, his love does not just accept you, but his love will also change you. Our problem is that we have preached one dimension of love, and our definition of love is perverse because we think that it allows for everything. But sometime when God loves you, he'll change you. And he and here's what's crazy. He'll be rude about it and not even ask your permission. He'll close certain doors. He'll turn certain stuff against you. But he's changing you because he loves you. Oh, y'all quiet so I got to crack this open. Love. The love of God will make you find out that a man is cheating on you. The love of God will make you find out that your daddy ain't really your daddy. The love of God will let the y'all don't like that type of teaching. You want to love that lie. You want to love that deceives. You want to love that's indirect. But I serve a God who loves you too much. You ready? To leave you how you are. Wait a minute now. He loves you too much to allow you to remain the same. So he says, what manner of love is this? That we should be called the sons of God. Verse 2. The world knows us not because it knew him not. Sounds similar? Our alienation, our separation from what is acceptable culturally or by the majority is what allows us to become. Now the next verse says something very, very interesting. Now, who has a church background? You know, y'all don't come up in holiness? Yeah. Mother, one of the things that we you do you know, we, we thought we could boss God around, yeah. but, but, but it felt real good to do it. I, you know, we, I hadn't seen a lot of miracles by folks saying, now, Lord, you know, right now, you know. We, but when you look at the uh, strength that is concealed in the term now, it means in response to things that have happened before it. So the, the, the verse above this says, because the world does not know us, and then he comes and says, now, now. So you cannot become the son of God until you have passed the test of not being comprehended and not being known. He says, now are we the sons of God. Y'all ready? Y'all ready? And it doth not yet appear what we're going 
going to be. And you may not be able to get to play clues and categories and ask mommy and daddy and TG and Mother Smith and Maybell and them. You may not be able to figure it out by gathering fingerprints on your purpose. But what you need to know is you are definitely becoming a thing. You are becoming a species. You are becoming a breed of something that the world has not seen. Now that thing makes me shout. If I was at all nations, I would be running around here hitting myself in the head because I know I'm on my way to be coming something that I'm not right now. It doth not yet appear what you shall become. But we know this that when he appears, we will be like him. Now are we the sons of God. Sit down, Zion. Now are we the sons of God. Paul said you used to be aliens and you used to be foreigners and you worship done idols, but you went from whoring out to other gods to being called the sons of God. Ah, that power has worked into you. And I want to tell you something that's going to make you mad in San Antonio. God ain't sending no divas. He ain't sending no life coaches. This is the season of the sun. Go ahead and get mad. When God wants to get the job done, he's going to only send the sun. For God so loved the wise tell you that he gave his only begotten son. I believe God's making a son out of you because there are things he can trust his sons with that creation can't handle. Hallelujah. I feel a praise. Hallelujah. Creation ain't groaning for no Christians. Creation ain't groaning for no believers. Creation ain't groaning for no celebrities. What creation wants is the sons. Now are we the sons of God. It doth not yet appear. When you start to become, it's going to be a while before you figure out what God is doing. Melissa, who are you? Your name is Melissa. Run up here right now, and I believe the Lord says you're a soldier or something. Come right here. Lift your hands up. I'm going to just kind of preach over you because this is your word. Where your boy at? You got a son that's a preacher? Where is he? Where you at? He's not here? Okay, you tell that boy I said he's going to preach or is he going to be tormented. Lift your hands. Now. Oh, that's what I mean. You see, it does not. That was it. That was the word in demonstration. It does not appear what this woman's boy is going to be. But we know this: that when Jesus comes in the room, he gonna be whatever God said he was gonna be. I believe God is about to raise the son. Go ahead and praise him, cause he's making you something you're not. Right. Hey, I feel it now. Hallelujah. Woman, whatever this thing is, this decision that's scaring you, Satan is trying to uproot you and make you go somewhere else for something. But I heard the Lord say, not so. Your feet will be planted in this soil and in this house, and I'll give you favor on a job that'll never want you to move again. You tell your boy, God's going to grip him by the neck and pull him from under the sway of hell and loose arrows of deliverance to his life because of what you suffered. I lose fire. Somebody go crazy in this Baptist church. I said go crazy. I'm on my way. Ay, 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 ay. Tell somebody I'm about to become. Open your mouth and hear. This ain't Sunday morning. I didn't come to play church with you. Tell somebody I'm about to become something. I'm on my way to becoming something. Shout hallelujah. And as, and as many... As many that, as many that have this hope, they purify themselves. It'll make you pure if you put your hope in the fact that God's making you to become something. Is there anybody in here who's had their hope under attack? 
you know. Come on, don't lie to me. We here. We here. You can be fake Sunday morning. That's what I tell you. Anybody had their hope come under attack? I'm not certain about what God is doing or where he's taking me. But here's how God's going to heal your hope. God is making you something that you're not right now. It doesn't feel good. I don't have all the details. But you are about to become something that you didn't know you could become. That you didn't believe you could become. He's bringing the pieces together to transform you. And you're getting ready to go from glory to glory. And from strength to strength. And from faith to faith. Scream if you believe it. I, I, I can't hear you. Turn the volume up in your heart. I'm getting ready to become something. Yeah, come on, I feel the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir. Oh. I want, I want this gentleman with this ponytail. trying to wait till the fire hits your row. Just lift your hands up, man. Thank you somebody to move this for me. Somebody scream, become, become, become. Come on, say become, 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 become. Want you to know that I'm going to deal with you about a couple of things, and the first thing I'm going to deal with is what happened to you in May when when Satan made a decision to permanently remove you from the kingdom. You go, okay, Lord, and the Lord says. That there has been several death attempts against you and the destruction of your sanity. And I want to tell you something. Your mother didn't really know what she was doing when she named you Emmanuel. Your name means God with us for a reason. And what's this? The the sound of a baby boy I hear. His name is the name of a Bible prophet. I believe it's, it's probably an E as well, Ezra. The Holy Ghost wants you to know that he raised you from the grave. That Ezra would not be exposed to what you were exposed to. And the Lord says before January 1, that failure mechanism that comes to you every year. It started happening when you were 14. Not only has the Lord opened up a door for a different job, that thing that stopped you from pursuing your next degree of education, God's breaking it off of your life. You are not a failure. I heard the Lord say, I'm with you. Hallelujah! And if I'm with you, I'm more than the world against you. Somebody give the Lord praise all over this building. What's wrong with y'all? I thought we were Pentecostal. Come on. God's called you to become. He's mandated that you become. Shout hallelujah. Hey. 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 <laughs> out of you. You've not been able to really perceive it. But this year has been about God conditioning you for what he wants you to become. And for many of you, God is 
He didn't need to come here. He didn't need to you. What does his sweater know? God has kept the details from you. But what he wants you to become is non-negotiable. I heard the Lord say, I heard the Lord say, your disappointments has been what Satan has used against you. And your knowledge of your own potential has been what has tormented you. But your inability to recover from being dropped by a male figure in your life has been what has glued you, even with this uh, back and forth depression thing. And I heard a meeting in hell where devils gathered around a boardroom saying, we'll kill him, we'll poison him, he won't live. And the Lord will not hear him because he disobeyed. But if I be a prophet of God, the Lord wants you to know that the worst thing that ever happened to you is going to be the greatest thing that ever happened to you. God wants you to know that your family those that have been anticipating your death and your demise, even outside of this state, I'm about to do a cross. I heard the Lord say, try state. Tell them to keep paying attention because God's about to punctuate your story. I see you. Um, you were supposed to actually, I see several appointments with death that you had, but one of them, Satan had planned to make you lose your mind in a rubber room by losing your mind and losing your sanity. But I heard the Lord say he delivered you for the moment that it's now. Do not die here. You have not begun to see what the Lord will do for a man that will live holy. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord out of this place. Come on, what? Come on, give God glory. says to tell you, pour, pour water on the hands of the man God assigned you to, and turn your ears to those that would be like talent scouts. Are you married? Where's your wife? Okay. <laughs> your wife comes under a lot of attack, and a lot of mental stress, and it, the, it, you know, she's got a mouth on her. But I want you to know it's because there's a strong prophetic grace uh, on her, which makes her say things offensively sometimes. And uh, But here's God's promise to you. Mm. If you will obey the Lord and if you will remain consistent, God says he will heal the last seven years of your life. What you are, what you are expecting to be an embarrassing moment will become a trophy in the arsenal of your testimony. I prophesy 
that that spirit of sonship comes upon you and that you abase yourself. You had started and then uh, moved because of disappointment. But God says to tell you, 2016, he's going to perfect those things that concern her. Glory to God. And you tell your wife she'll never be able to please angry women. There are those around her she's trying to please, that they are putting their own fears on her vicariously. And I heard the Lord say God's about to cause necessary uh, 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 cuts to come to get her hold from her past. She has had difficulty believing that you are different from the man that loved her before you. But I heard the Lord say, he's going to heal this marriage. Hallelujah! And he's going to release you. Come on, give, some, give God some praise. I said, give him the glory. I said, give him the glory. You're about to become something. Hey, glory. I said, give him the glory. It wasn't for nothing. Come on, what you looking at me? I said, bless him. Hallelujah. Uh, I'm done after this one, I think. I'm going to see you tomorrow. But I've been sent to help articulate what you're becoming. You love your mama. You have watched your mama undergo some very excruciating things. And it has almost made you feel guilty to see the direction of your life and your success uh, and what looks like the family you've left behind. And I don't know if people know this, but very often in your head you go back and forth about what the future holds, about where you're going to be. But today the Lord lays it to rest because God's word to you is that he's making you become something that you're not aware of altogether right now. There comes an opportunity and there comes an open door and it's going to look like the promise of God. But I heard the Lord say it'll be a counterfeit and that you are not to put your name on that paper because God's not done with you. It's going to be about 48 months and then the Lord is going to bring a miraculous opportunity and this nation will know your name. But I heard the Lord say, music, music and song is where you're anointed, but it has become a crutch to you. The Lord's going to break your back in prayer. And he's going to call you. I don't know anything about you, but I see that you used to have a grace to fast. It would come upon you, and you would go without. God's going to put that thing back upon your life to complete some stuff. Okay. And there's going to be some forgiveness. I want you to hear this. Okay. I, I don't want to put all your business out there, but the Lord wants you to know sometimes you've got to accept the apology you'll never receive. And that part of you that's waiting for that man to look back and say, I wish I did, and I wish I was, and I wish I was fair to you, you got to find closure without it. Uh, because in a couple of years, your family's going to need your mercy. Father, I lay hands on this one, and I thank you for what you're doing. And I command every lying voice from the west coast from the east coast every distraction I release a laser like focus to him and he'll settle himself in the thing that God is calling him to do and give him the heart of prayer and an intercession and of worship I don't know your mom is recovering from as far as a, some type of tear or rip in her life, something very like a, some type of separation, but the Lord wants you to, to know he's got your mama. And, and she's not going to go back to being the woman she was as a result of this pain in her life. He's going to prove to you that your prayers work. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord in this building. 
Glory to God. It doth not yet appear what we shall become, but we're going to be just like him. Back here in this computer booth, because you had the opportunity to leave and did not, the Lord wants you to know he's about to blow on your nine to five. You have been insecure about your inability to provide and your inability to stand as a man on your own two feet. But the Spirit of the Lord says, I'm going to cause you to find favor and I'm going to break that three generation curse of rent off of your life and I'm going to make you reign among princes because of your faithfulness in this house. Somebody go crazy. I said go crazy. I said go crazy. Oh, it's a power. I feel a praise trying to speak up in here. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hey, 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 hey. Glory, glory. We're going to take our, a, a, a sacrificial offering tonight. But the word of the Lord to you is you're about to become something. I wish you were excited about that. Tell the person next to you, you're about to become something. You're about to become something. you to get a sacrifice in your hand. We're going to sow into what we believe the Lord to do this weekend. Every one of you. There was a guy that was operating the camera. Where did he go? That old... Come here. God's about to do what you asked him, but you got to give him the right answer. You've given God the wrong answer. And you thought that you could outsmart them by being clever. But the Lord wants you to know that the last answer you gave him has got to switch. Before he opens up the door that he wants him to open. Submit your heart. And the Lord will not only open the door, he'll give you the contract. But you've got to submit your heart to him. And you'll find that he'll do everything uh, that you want him to do for your life. Glory to God, including something with this living situation. The Holy Ghost will turn this thing around for you if you will give him the right answer. Come on, put those hands together for the Lord all over this building. Glory to God. I want every one of you to get an, uh, an envelope in your hand to give the absolute largest gift that you can. Glory to God. I want you to sow in proportion to what you believe God is about to make you become. May that word bless you tonight. I mean, I, I, it's, I feel like God is breaking so many yokes in this building tonight. Glory to God. Oh, this guy here with this here, um, well, I really describe things horribly when I'm prophesying. So please don't get offended. The glasses on. So I want you to stand up hard too. What's your name? You belong here? For about a month? Okay. All right. Lift your hand. Is your pastor in the building? Okay. I'm glad you told me that so I won't get in trouble. Lift your hand. Certain things only, uh, you had a dream from God concerning some things God wants to do in your future and it's actually a part of what drove you to this environment because you know you are in need of something different and something more and today is Friday 
this Thursday. Monday, you made a deal with God sitting before a laptop computer that if he gave you a sign, you would obey. The Lord says this is your final sign. Obey me, and I'll make you everything you need to be. I'll be a prophet of God. If you obey this test from the Lord, it'll be messy for about three months, but after that, you'll find victory in your life and in your future. Stand up and lift that offering all the way to the Lord. All of y'all, come on, stand up, stand up, stand up. Stand up. Lift, lift your envelope so high until the person next to you gets convicted. Father, tonight you've given me the authority to pronounce prosperity. And I thank you for what you're releasing in this environment. And I pronounce that tonight an anointing to mature and to grow. And that a new season begins as a byproduct of these meetings. I give you honor for what you're doing. And let this season stand as a memorial of what you're bringing to pass in these lives. In the holy and awesome name of Jesus we pray. I don't know if we pass the buckets. You want to bring them up here or bring those offerings to the Lord. Let's just do that that way. Come up here. Come on. Let's do it real quickly. your heart and he's been trying to get your attention for about 90 days now and I'm going to tell you it started with a door that slammed hard in your face and when you had sought to blame somebody, probably this lady behind you or you sought to blame the people around you you looked up and found that you were confronted with the God that you left the Lord says tonight this word was directed ex exactly to you. There were some powers that operated against your life to kill you. That is not, and you know what, I almost want to say it was witchcraft. That, that should have taken you out of here. But I'm going to prophesy concerning your purpose. You have, now this is something, I don't know who knows it, but I'm going to tell you. You've had, you've always had encounters with devils. You have seen them. Sometimes they've appeared over your bed. When you were teenagers, they came to you, you heard things. You have the oil of an evangelist on your life. And uh, God says, until you tell him yes. He's going to make sure that things are hard. He has a way of getting your attention. Now, you have a need before you right now as we speak. Glory to God, a provisional need. And the Lord says, if you will commit and give me 2016 before it gets here, I will make sure that nobody has the power to lay you off again. 
Did you hear me what I said? I'll make sure that nobody has the power to lay you off again. Now, I wish you would act like you had the Holy Ghost and stump on your feet real quick and give God the best praise you got. Praise Him. Come on, praise Him. Come on, from your belly. Come on, from your belly. From your belly. Come in. From your belly. Come on, from your belly. From your belly. Come your belly. Come on. Hey. Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. If you need a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost, run up here real quick. I feel old school Pentecost. God, come on, run. I said run, church. If you want a fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost, run up here and just lift your hands up. Come on, all over the room. Come on, call him. I feel like God's going to release it now. Come on, I want you to come up here. Run. Come on, call him. I believe God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. And he's going to take that taste out your mouth. Come on, lift your hands. Come on, lift your hands. Come on. With the fire of the Holy Ghost. Come on, cry out. Like you were in the upper room. Hey! Holy. Come on, Jesus. A fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. A fresh infilling of the Holy Ghost. Fresh and filling, come on. Ah, come on. Like fire in your mouth. Come on. A fresh A fresh and filling. The spirit of prayer come upon you. Come on, there you go, man. It's like fire. Hey, 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 hey. Come on, a fresh and filling. A fresh and Straight through you. I feel the anointing. Ah, fire. There it goes. Straight through you. Be filled tonight. Hey, be filled tonight. Holy, straight through you. Be filled tonight. I know you're working, but be filled tonight. The spirit of prayer. Holy. I said be filled tonight. Come on, be filled tonight. See, come on. Come on, my man. Hey, holy. Come on. I feel the Holy Ghost. Come on. Come on, my new man. Yeah. Come on, I feel it. Come on. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. A fresh one. Yeah, that can happen tonight. Jesus, come on. Come on, come on. Wow. Come on. Come on, from your belly. Come on. Jesus. Come on, I feel it now. Ah. Come on. Deliverance is coming tonight. It's coming to you. Yes, sir. Hey, be filled. Come on. Hey, be filled. Come on with the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost. Come on, you need it. Come on, from your belly. Hey, from your belly. From your belly. Come on. Yeah, 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 yeah. Come on, church. This is revival. Come on, come alive. Come alive. Come on. Come on, from your belly. Come on, work with it. Hey, hey, hey. Hey, hey. Come on, mama. Hey. The Holy Ghost. Come on, be filled. Be filled. Come on, be filled. Drink and vision. Dreams and visions. Come on, let it come upon you. Come on, drink deeply, man. Drink deeply. Ooh, come on. Straight through you. Shot. Oh. Oh. Come on, there you go. Come on. Come on. Fix out this. Yes, sir. With the Holy Ghost. is yours. Holy! Ah, come on, drink deeply, man. Your prayer life is being revived. Hallelujah! Out of your belly. Come on, I feel this thing. Come on, call him. Hey! 
Praise Him! 
Jesus, Father, we thank you for this moment that you have afforded us in your glory. Now let us be sealed with what you, hey, Jesus, let what you shared be sealed in our hearts with great confidence that not many days from today, a manifestation, I said a manifestation of what you declared in the spirit would show up in 